Good evening and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for the next hour of answering your gardening questions. If you have something you need help with in your garden, you can give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. Those phone volunteers will be glad to help you. We also accept those questions and pictures via email for a future show, and that address is byf at unl.edu. We do need to know where you live. We need as much information about your question as you can give us. After the show, we'd like to invite you to check out our YouTube channel to see past programs and features, as well as hit the like button on our Facebook page. So let's start with samples. And you have one, Kate, that we've been getting a lot of questions yes, about. they seem very common this year. So I brought with me some European earwigs. So um, as you mentioned, they're really common. Sometimes you find them in your house. Sometimes you find them in the garden. And I've seen a lot in the garden. And um, despite their name earwigs, they do not go into ears and they do not tunnel into brains. I've heard that, <laughs> um, but they look kind of intimidating. So if you're not familiar with what they look like, you might notice that they have these large um, pincer like cerci and the males have larger ones. They use those for mating and defense, um, but these guys are on omnivorous. So 90% of the time, they're not going to be an issue in the landscape. And then the other 10% of the time they will eat plants and cause damage, particularly in um, vegetable gardens. So if you do notice a lot of earwigs in the garden and you do notice a lot of damage, there's some really simple things that you can do. They like um, cool, dark places, so trapping them works well. You can lay down a board in the evening or a rolled up newspaper, check that in the morning, put them in soapy water. Otherwise, um, get a, either a can of tuna or a shallow dish that you can make level with the soil. Um, put oil in that and they're attracted to that greasy oil and they'll go in there and you have trapped some earwigs. So pretty easy to manage, but they're very common right now. All right, thanks, Kate. Dennis, welcome back from snake country. Oh, good. The whole country is snake country. We don't want it to be. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about bats. We always say, you know, let them fly till July. Well, it's July. So now the young in the maternity ward are ready to go out. So now you can exclude them and then you can patch up those holes so they can't come back. And there's several ways you can exclude them. If your crack or way they're getting in and out is in a corner, you can use this excluder. If it's a small crack, you can use this. So wherever there's a crack, they'll go out, but they can't come back in. And then you can fill that back up. We also have, if you have a big crack, you can just get bird netting and put weights on the bottom of it. And so say they were coming out of this crack right here, then they would come out, they fly around, and they try to come back, they'll try to hit this, and then they can't get in because of this netting, and they'll go elsewhere. So as of July, and you probably should get it done before October when they go to hibernate, um, you, this is a time to put your one-way doors on, have the bats find a new place, and then exclude them. And remember, they can't chew through hardly anything, so any caulking in those holes will keep them out. Perfect. Thank you, Dennis. Mm -hmm. So we have a guest, turf grass pathologist, and Mike, you actually brought turf grass. I brought some turf grass, Kim. It is uh, July in Nebraska, and if you've got tall fescue in your yard, uh, you're probably noticing some browning of the leaves. And if you look really close, get down on your hands and knees, you will see these irregular uh, spots, uh, tan lesions, if you will. So they're irregular shaped, and uh, they're often surrounded with a uh, brown or a purplish color um, margin. Uh, that's what's happening out there uh, in the lawns, just a little bit of rust starting, but brown patch, pretty common right now. And what should people do about it? Yeah, so right now, I think, uh, you know, I really don't recommend spraying. Um, it is what it is. Uh, hopefully uh, your yard has got some bluegrass in there mixed in and uh, you can weather it if you don't mind a little bit of brown. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. All right, Sarah, we've had several questions about this, so I'm glad you brought it. Sure. I thought I'd talk a little bit tonight about what's blooming on the <coughs> roadside. And this is one of the most showy flowers that we're seeing right now. This is bird's foot trefoil. And bird's foot trefoil is not a native plant. It, it's actually introduced from Europe. It was brought in um, to help with erosion control. It is also can be 
uh, grown as a forage, uh, especially in poor soil. It can work, uh, it can have more forage value in poor soil than alfalfa does. So um, we see this along the, the interstates, um, along the country roads. Um, it does tolerate mowing and it grows into kind of a flat mat of foliage with all these beautiful little yellow flowers on it. Um, bird's foot trefoil is in the legume family, so it is, a, it is a bean type of plant, and it is nitrogen fixing in the soil. And if you look really close, you'll find these cute little brown bean pods like this that tell you that it is in the bean family. So um, uh, it also has some value for pollinators too. I had to fight some bees off to get this sample. So. <laughs> bird's foot trefoil. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's really pretty. I love it all over everything right now. Mm -hmm. So thanks for bringing that. All right, Kate, you get the first round of picture questions. Uh, your first one here, you have three pictures and we've never had this one before. This is an Omaha viewer. They have new button bushes planted last September. They found bumps on the leaves. What is it? Is there treatment or do they have to replace the shrubs? Those are beautiful. Yeah, so these are definitely galls and there's not a lot of literature on them, but um, from button, button bush, from what I was able to find, these are caused by um, aerophyid mites. So as you know, galls, um, they form when something feeds on the plant and pretty much the plant overreacts and forms this tissue around the mite in this case. Um, as with all galls, it's mostly just cosmetic, um, not going to harm the overall health of the plant. That being said, it seems like there's quite a lot of galls on this particular one. So if it becomes an issue, you can remove um, the heavily infested leaves. And if it gets really bad, you should be able to cut that bush, button bush back in the spring and kind of start from scratch there. All right, excellent. And sometimes you have to do that anyway because they don't necessarily like our winters. Mm -hmm. Perfect, all right, Kate, you have two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is a Lincoln, Nebraska viewer, uh, Magnolia. So the first one is the uh, structure. The second is yours. <laughs> yeah, so um, just starting off overall, the Magnolia tree doesn't look the best. And it could, part of it could be due to, these are Magnolia scales. So scale insects suck the sap of the tree and magnolia scales in particular can be pretty difficult to manage. And usually we recommend contacting an arborist. Um, this particular tree, you might wanna weigh the costs and benefits. It might be time to take it out, but if you do have a tree where you need to manage magnolia scale, as with all scale insects, timing is really important because you wanna target those crawler stages. So when they first come out, they're crawlers and that's when they're most susceptible to insecticides. So Magnolia scale in Nebraska, this is gonna be around mid-August. Check for those crawlers. If you find them, you can do a contact insecticide. Um, you can also prune out heavily infested branches and you might need to contact an arborist to consider a systemic. All right, thanks, Kate. Uh, you have one more picture and this is uh, just a curiosity, he thinks. He uh, thinks it's an eastern-eyed click beetle and it's, uh, he's wondering if it's out of its normal range because this is from Columbus. Well, he's absolutely right. This is an eastern eyed click beetle, and um, we do see these in Nebraska. Um, they're not the most common here because, of course, as you go further east, the more common they are. But I do believe um, I've seen some people find them all the way to the panhandle, and that's probably about as west as they get. But um, they're really beautiful. They're called eastern eyed click beetles because they have those big, gorgeous eye spots, and um, you're absolutely right. And, and where's the click come from? The click, so they're called click beetles because when they're on their back, they have this little clicking mechanism that makes an audible sound and it flips them back upright. <laughs> Fun, all right, thanks, Kate. Okay, Dennis, uh, your first two pictures okay. come to us from Norfolk. Um, this viewer has multiple new aspen trees and two of them have died already and the ones furthest from the house have all of these spots above the mesh. Yeah. And he's wondering what uh, creature is attacking them and what does he do about yeah, it? It looks like probably a rabbit and it was done when there was snow cover. That's how it got above, above that mesh. Looking at those injuries, they look like they occurred during the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it definitely looks like <laughs> rabbit chewing. So what you can do is put more protection, higher protection. You gotta remember, no, they can't reach over two foot, but if you have snow cover, they can go up to four foot if the snow, so better protection. Okay, how about the flat branch? Is that also a rabbit or do you think there's a tree That's a, No, it's too, it's too small for a squirrel to climb up that and do that. And I see no scratch marks, so I'm going with a rabbit. All right. Cottontail. 
Cottontail. Not Jack. Peter Cottontail. I don't know his name. I didn't check that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, your next one, you have three pictures, Dennis. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a viewer who has weeping mulberry, and it only partially leafed out. He uh, wonders if squirrels chewing on the bark have could have been the cause of a lot of this damage. He's included pictures of this, although he says there's more of it under the canopy there. Right. So what do you think? Yeah, fox squirrels. And uh, I'd be weeping over that mulberry too. Um, mm -hmm. And once the squirrels ch chew that camnion down to get that sugar out, and they do that in the winter, and if they go more than three quarters of the way around a branch, it's a, it's a goner. Yeah, so. that's too bad. Because yeah, that's fox squirrels for sure. Those um, poor, those weeping mulberries are gorgeous things. Yeah. So, all right, Dennis. Okay, Mike, you have one for this first one. Um, this is a spot between the curb and the sidewalk in Lincoln. Suddenly when the weather got hot, these spots started showing up and then they started growing together. What is it? What do they do about it either now or later? This happens every year. And this Neat. is several Lincoln viewers. Yeah, so that's dollar spot. That's my guess. Uh, and the spots are, as the name uh, signifies, about the size of a silver dollar, if you will. And, and uh, usually that hits uh, once the temperatures warm up to say 65 and it really is active through about 85, 86 degrees. Um, it tends to uh, be a problem on uh, turf that is under fertilized, but it's a common disease and then the spots coalesce and you end up with, with a, a problem there. Again, if it's a large area, you might consider a fungicide uh, application if it's uh, bothersome to you. Otherwise, once it warms up, the dollar spot will go away. And uh, if you have any tall fescue in there, you'll have some brown patch that comes in. So <laughs> always something. All right. Your second one is also a single picture. Uh, this is in South Bend. The spot was a decent grass for years. He does say it went dormant early in the fall and then took a really long time to green up. Mm. Never really spread into the existing lawn, but this year it looks like this. He's wondering, is this a disease or to be treated or just start over? Yeah, it's uh, at this point, uh, I would definitely be uh, investigating maybe what's underneath that dead turf. Um, there are some weeds in there. I see some nut sedge and uh, always take a look at the environment to start with. Uh, it doesn't look like there's shade in this part, but you don't see the whole yard. Uh, if there was a good turf cover there last year, sometimes, um, you know, there could have been a tree there a while ago and the actual, um, as the roots decay, the, uh, the, the soil becomes hydrophobic, a fancy word that it just won't absorb water. And given the winter that we had and the lack of snow cover, uh, and then the slow green up, my guess is uh, there could be something going on in that soil and uh, then just kind of till it up and reseed, but don't reseed until the fall. Okay, two pictures on this next one. This is a Fremont uh, viewer. His grass looks nice and green every spring. Then in June, it starts doing this. It's an old, bluegrass lawn. An old bluegrass lawn. Um, good, good golly, that's a tight picture. I would say if that's bluegrass, I'm going to hedge on this one quite a bit um, to see the sample. Um, could be a, a foliar disease like a, it almost looks like brown patch, but um, an old bluegrass lawn. Um, I'm seeing a little bit of rust on Kentucky bluegrass. Um, that too is uh, connected back to fertility. And then with the changes in environmental uh, conditions, maybe we're seeing a little bit of that. Okay, and two pictures on this next one. And this is actually a viewer from Spirit Lake, Iowa. He wants to know what this grass is and is there a chemical that will kill it but not harm the other grass? Mm. Can he spray it in the heat of the summer? Yeah, so if we can go back, I think that, um, you know, difficult to tell until it uh, <clears throat> seeds out, seed head out, but it looks like a, a foxtail, maybe yellow foxtail. Um, the seed head looks like a fox's tail uh, when it gets out a little bit there. There is a chemical that uh, you can use, tenacity. But um, usually between 65 and 85 degrees is the, the typical spraying uh, temperature. If you go when it's warmer than that, you run the risk of hurting the grass that you're not interested in killing, in this case, the Kentucky bluegrass. All right, thanks, Mike. Sarah, this is uh, a viewer who is in Kearney. 
And these are autumn blaze maples. She's wondering if they're doomed because uh, they've grown a lot. They're in a circle of fabric. The bark has fallen off. Roots are coming up above the ground and then they're doing this sprouting from the base. What do you think here? Well, there's a pretty large wounded area on that trunk. Um, and we only kind of saw it from a side view, but um, I, it would be interesting to see how much of that bark is actually dead on that tree. It would also be good to see how much branch dieback, if any, there is in the canopy above. Um, but usually when a tree sends up suckers like that, it's often a sign of stress. So I can't be real definitive you know, with just the limited information from these pictures, but I would just say good care, you know, make sure it stays watered during dry periods, make sure it's, it's mulched um, if for an area around the base. And um, uh, that's the best you can do to try to keep this tree going. All um, right, uh, two pictures on this next one, Sarah. This is a sycamore. She sent uh, more pictures, but these are the two that tell the tale. It was fine until last week, planted last year, but apparently when they bought it, the top had been uh, cut off. Is this a goner also? Well, I mean, you've had some pretty significant top dieback, although there are some branches that are still alive, but even those branches have pretty sparse foliage. So I would, I would look at the junction between the dead top part and the base or and the, the living tissue to see if there's a canker there or some kind of physical damage. Um, is it a goner? It's hard to tell. Um, it, it looks like it's very, very stressed and not doing well. Um, so we're either gonna need to change the care or you may lose it. All right, and two more pictures, Sarah. This comes to us from Lexington. Uh, this is a walnut, and uh, he wonders what's causing this yellowing. They have aerial spraying in the area, but it's also been, of course, extremely dry and windy in that part of the state. Yeah, I, I think most likely this is some type of herbicide <coughs> damage. From that initial picture where you see that the damage is so directional on one side of the tree, I think drift coming from that direction has probably affected this foliage. Although the damage on the foliage doesn't look like the traditional type of damage we would see with uh, a growth regulator herb herbicide like 2,4-D or dicamba, it could be some other type of herbicide, but I think most likely that's what's happened. If some of the foliage dies, the, the hope is that the buds on those branches are still alive um, and they will send out some new growth. So um, it, it looks like this tree will probably recover from this. All right, thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> well, we've made some additions to our garden over the years, including expansion and the rain chain. After dealing with some erosion problems after heavy rains and needing to add a garden that produces more food, we decided to install a retaining wall to help keep things in place. For our first feature, we're going to show you how we did it and why it might be a good idea in your landscape. May have a really good reason for building a retaining wall in your own home landscape. You have to think about a lot of issues before you really get started with that. First off, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you leveling some soil, like our retaining wall here for our garden, so that it is easier to work in and flatter? Are you trying to control erosion? Do you have a steep slope that you just can't get down? Do you want to create some terraces? So think about all of those first before you go off and decide what kind of materials you want to use on it. We chose block on this one because it matches what we already have. It's relatively simple to work with because the blocks themselves have the actual setback that is required from course to course so that the wall slants like this rather than being vertical. Huge huge issue with retaining walls is how you get that base in the ground. And if you're doing a dry stack wall like this or like the ones that are a little bit more natural, the stone walls, the boulder walls, you still need that base to be able to get those stones or those materials set well before you start building up. And in this case, we used a series of aggregates. The block that is actually buried at the bottom is a different kind of block that is a little easier to work with, supports that wall above it. The other thing to really think about is how high are you going? Because by code and certainly by safety, even if there wasn't a code, if you go high, then you really need an engineer. You need a lot of different sorts of design issues and then construction to be able to keep it from failing. Another one is the drainage behind the wall. 
And in this case, we did not put drain tile behind because we didn't need it, but you would ideally, or in a, a situation where you know that, that water is an issue, you wanna do some tile behind the wall, let that pressure of the water behind it when we get a rain come through the wall so you don't have that expanding, contracting soil, the weight of the water, pushing that wall forward and making that wall fail. So it's a little bit more complicated than just going off and buying the materials and starting to stack. And as you'll notice on this one, this is, and this is typical of retaining walls, at some point they come to zero so that you're, you're not building a box, a square box, which would really be just a raised bed. You go to zero and that means you're going to be doing some leveling. So keep those uh, elements in mind. Also then think about the backfill and the aggregate and those kinds of materials so that your soil behind and in front of that wall is not something that you can't actually even plant anything in because it's such crummy soil. This has really helped our production garden and kept that soil from running down the slope after those big rains. All right, Kate, you have uh, two pictures on this first one. This comes from our little six-year-old in Wayne, Nebraska. And uh, these guys are munching on the hostas, a lot of damage very fast. They did uh, spray with insecticidal soap. What is this? Um, so these are blister beetles. And as their name suggests, these are one of the look, don't touch insects. And they produce a toxin that's called cantharidin. And if you get it on your skin, it can cause blisters. And it's also um, toxic if ingested. So that's an issue a lot of times with like horses and cattle and things like that. So on top of all that, these particular kinds also like to eat and damage plants. Um, as far as control, um, with a lot of beetles, you can hand pick them off and put them in soapy water, just wear gloves, some sort of protection against that chemical. Um, and then you can try other things like spinosad, um, carbaryl, and permethrin would be some good options for these too. All right, Kate, thanks. Your next one is a Council Bluffs viewer. Uh, found this critter on a wood chip pile, wonders good or bad. He uh, said it's active, it flips, it curls, and it has a very co colorful pattern and looks very mean. Yeah, so um, the first picture, it was upside down, so I couldn't really see any identified characteristics. And this is actually, the second picture is a picture of its back end. Um, it's not its face, so it has a mean back end. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm 99% sure it's a type of owlet moth. I'm less sure, but leaning towards a type of underwing moth. And from these pictures, that's about as much as I can tell you. But either way, it's probably not a foe. All right, great. And one more picture. This is an Omaha viewer. Wonders, is this a variegated fritillary caterpillar? Yeah, you guys are so good at bug ID today. <laughs> yes, this is a variegated fritillary caterpillar. And um, they'll feed on mostly passion vine and violets, but we can also find them on like lamb's ear and um, purslane. And they have really cool chrysalises, chrysalis. I'm not sure the right word for that, but um, they're really pretty. So keep an eye out for those. All right, thank you, Kate. Dennis, your first one here, you're gonna be so happy. Okay. This I is Columbus. Uh, what kind of snake is this? That's a bull snake, the most common in the state, grows to eight foot, extremely beneficial and 100% harmless. All right, uh, your next one is, I live in Bellevue, and this was a Slytherin under the White Pines a few yeah. weeks ago. That's a full-grown uh, decays brown snake, um, and she looks like she's pregnant. They have live birth. Um, they don't get bigger than 12 to 15 inches, and that coloration is not average. Please call me. <laughs> That's a genetic aberration. That usually they're brown, but it's definitely... Uh, story or decay. And you want her? I just want to get some pictures of her. She can be. All right. You have one more here. Uh, this is actually uh, from Omaha, sent Midtown. She knows it's not much to go on, but she yeah. sees this trail from tree to tree. She wonders, is this a squirrel, an opossum? What is this? Likely suppose? a fox squirrel if it's going tree to tree. Okay, yeah. even that much in the grass, huh? Yeah, they like to follow each other, especially young ones, so they just <laughs> The little, little feet. <laughs> All right, little cow feet. Yeah. All right, Mike, you have uh, three pictures, no turf involved, but this is green beans. Uh, she's a good gardener in Aurora. She mm. wonders, is this bacterial or fungal? She didn't plant beans here for the past two years, wonders how long it takes to get rid of the problem, and she has some other ones that are more resistant. 
Yeah, this is a, a little tricky. I mean, at first uh, I saw, uh, thought it was halo blight, but as I looked at those pictures and this on you know, the underside of the leaf, that one up there at about 10 o'clock looks a little bit like halo blight, but uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, to be honest with you. Beans are also um, with overhead watering and the temperature that we had, if you get a spot of water, if there is overhead watering, I, I would stop it, uh, especially if some of the beans are, um, healthy looking and some are looking like this. This was a little tricky. I'd, I would have loved to have the sample, take a look at it. All right, and you have one here that is um, carny viewer, potatoes with holes in them. Yeah. More hole than potato. Yeah, I mean, this looks like a potato scab to me, maybe with some insect feeding on there as well. Mm -hmm. um, Kate's shaking her head, yeah, so that's what I'm gonna go with. All right. Sarah, you have uh, a viewer from Norfolk. This is a viewer who has a 12 to 15 year old raspberry bed and she's wondering why they're so dinky this year. So there's a couple things that could cause this. Um, drought could cause it uh, when the, the flowers were setting and forming. Um, and it seems like you have some aborted flowers there too. So, you know, the plants could have just gotten way too dry. Um, also poor pollination. So if conditions were hot and dry, during the time when the flowers were pollinating, there could have been a poor transfer of pollen, and that can also result in very small berries like that. So if these are, are environmental problems, then hopefully next year, if we have better weather, you shouldn't see it again. All right, thanks, Sarah. And you have two pictures uh, for this next one. This viewer saw these roses in Ord. She's from Fordyce. She's wanting to know what variety they are and would they be suitable because she's never seen roses where they flower in the clusters like this. So unfortunately, I can't tell you what variety these are because there's, there's just so many rose varieties out there. It's, it's pretty impossible. Um, it's, it's likely if these are newer planting that they are some type of shrub rose. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of really attractive shrub roses um, that are very popular in the landscape industry because they're easier to take care of and they're more uh, tolerant of weather extremes than things like the hybrid teas and some of the heirloom roses are. So I would suggest you check out the Knockout Roses series and also the Proven Roses, the Proven Winners Roses series and see if there's any roses in those groupings that might be attractive to you that you want to try in your landscape. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Well, our garden is maturing and both our vegetables and flowers are really putting on a show. Let's take a few minutes to see what's happening in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're inviting you out again for the next East Campus Discovery Days. You'll be able to come see our fantastic garden and it is looking beautiful. We have lots of vegetables that are ready to be picked. We have some onions and some beets and some turnips that are ready to come out of the ground. We also have beautiful flowers. We have all of our All America Selection signs that are out. So you'll be able to learn all about all those plants that we talk about each week and be able to see them and be able then to go and pick them out to put in your own garden for next year. So come by the Backyard Farmer Garden and visit us for East Campus Discovery Days this Saturday, July 9th from 10 to 2 p.m. And you may even see some vintage Backyard Farmer gear here if you come and visit us. So check out the Backyard Farmer Garden. Right now it is time for the lightning round. All right, Sarah, are you ready? I'm ready. Multiple people sent this question, which is where can we get soil tests done in Nebraska? Um, in the Lincoln area, we use, uh, it used to be called Harris Ag Source, now it's VAS Labs. Um, but we, also, we do have a soils, uh, list of soils labs um, on the lancaster.unl.edu website. So you could check there if you're at other parts of the, the state and you want to find out what your local lab is. Excellent. We have a viewer whose iris just arrived and they want to know whether they should plant them or wait, wait a little while. You could plant them now, but you're going to have to give them some extra special care. I mean, given that conditions are so hot. So um, make sure that they stay watered. Make sure that you mulch them. Just try to get them over the hump of this hot part of summer. All right. A McClelland, Iowa viewer wants to know why the pumpkin blossoms uh, flower, but then they fall off instead of... All cucurbits have both male and female flowers, so it could be just the male flowers that are falling. All right. Uh, we have a Hickman viewer who wonders, is it possible for herbicide damage in the center of the garden on the tomatoes, but skipping everything else? 
Tomatoes are especially um, susceptible to the growth regulator type herbicide. So yes, it is possible that they would be affected, but other less susceptible plants would not really show damage. So that is possible. All right, nice job, Sarah. Okay, Mike, you ready? I'm ready, Ken. All right, this is an old Kentucky bluegrass lawn in Scott's Bluff. They wonder if they overseed with newer varieties, will that help with disease? Probably not. Okay, this is a Bennington viewer who said their fairy ring in their lawn disappeared in dry weather. Will a fungicide kill the fairy ring forever? Yeah, I think fairy rings, you either love them or you don't. Uh, I tend to like them. Uh, if you wanted to try to manage fairy ring, maybe try first some fertilizer and, and dovetail in that fertilizer to kind of get the dark green blending in with the, the not so green lawn. Okay, this is an Omaha viewer who has round dead spots, but they have a green center in the middle of the round part. Is that the heat or is that a disease? Um, probably a disease, but I'd want to take a look at the roots. A lot of root diseases kind of give you that frog eye uh, patch, All like right. fusarium, for example. This is a, a Lincoln viewer who has perennial rye, have had it for years, and they have pythium. Is that possible in a lawn in Lincoln? Um, certainly with the heat and the humidity that we've had, having foliar pythium is very possible. All right, nice job. Okay, ready? I'm always ready. You're always ready, all right. Your first one, Dennis, is, uh, this, is a, this one just came in. This is a Waverly viewer mm -hmm. who wants to know how to get rid of a family of 13 lined ground squirrels. Well, it's usually a female and they're young. You can capture them, just use our NEB guide. All right, um, this is a La Vista viewer who found a dead garter snake that was fully stretched out like it just rolled over and died and he's wondering if snakes actually get bird flu. No. All right, um, this is a, a Lake McConaughey viewer who saw what she thinks is turkey vultures clinging to the vertical cliffs. Do they live in those holes in the cliffs? No, and I was just out there, but they do get salt from the cliffs in the rock. All right, uh, we have a Donovan viewer who wants to know whether it's pellets of some sort that you can buy will control pocket gophers. There is ZP or zinc phosphide bait that if used as instructed will control them. All right, we have an Aurora viewer who hung a bat house on the south peak of their garage. Will that get the bats to come? It's tough, you just gotta give it some time. All right, nice job. Okay, Kate. I'm ready. Last but not least, sometime we're gonna mix it up and go the <laughs> other direction. <laughs> All right, uh, we had a beautiful picture of a bee hotel in Wayne over the break, and they wanna know what that little bitty beautiful insect was. It's a cuckoo wasp. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Good guy or bad guy? Um, bad for the bees, they parasitize like other wasps too. All right, this is a Henderson viewer who sprayed their Japanese beetles with ortho home defense and they all dropped off. They're wondering uh, what they could do to prevent them from coming back next year. Um, so you can treat your turf for white grubs, but just keep in mind Japanese beetles can fly, so it's probably not gonna do you very good. They're just gonna show up no matter what. All right, uh, we have a milk, uh, a viewer in Walt Hill has milkweed and has small pollinators that have black and white striped rear ends. Do you know what those might be? He didn't have a picture. Um, pollinators, it could be bees, it could be hoverflies too. They like milkweed quite a bit. Okay, this is a Giltner viewer who wants to know, is there a systemic for Japanese beetles? Um, there is for certain plants like roses, but just keep in mind that some systemics, it can get taken up into the nectar and pollen of plants, so you just want to choose wisely. Right. You all did a very nice job. It was pretty close to a tie, but... <laughs> okay, Sarah, three plants of the week this week. Sort of red, white, and blue, but... Yeah. Kinda. So this little um, pale lavender flower here in the front, this is a Stokes Aster. And all of these three are perennials, so these would be great additions to a, a perennial garden. Stokes Aster um, has a nice little mound of foliage, and then um, uh, generally the plants get to be about um, 18, 24 inches tall, something like that. Um, so that's Stokes Aster. Then here on the other side, we have, going to a, a height extreme, we've got um, Meadow Sweet, uh, and this is um, a, a good plant for a wet area. So if you have like a pond or a, um, just a, a wetter area in your landscape, 
um, this would do very well. And it would gr it grows quite tall. It gets to be about six feet tall. So you do need to make sure that you have um, a good place for it. Also goes by the name Queen of the Meadow. Uh, Philippendula, Philippendula is the genus name for this. Um, and these many, many tiny little flowers with these little airy flower heads. Then the last one we have here in the middle, the tall white one, this is a tall garden phlox. And um, garden phlox are a great perennial for the garden. This particular one is a cultivar called David. And that is a very popular cultivar in the landscape industry because David is quite resistant to powdery mildew, which is one of the big banes that we have on the garden phlox. So David is a great cultivar. And of course, white is a great color to add into your landscape because it, it really kind of pops. It's great in the night garden and it helps to blend in some of those other stronger colors. So all three great perennials for a landscape garden. And all in the backyard farmer garden mm -hmm. so people can see them during discovery days. All right, uh, Kate, your next one here is, uh, this one came to us from Custer, South Dakota. What is this cool creature? I love him. He's like wearing a tuxedo with leg warmers. Um, so this <laughs> is a phantom crane fly. So if you're familiar with crane flies, they look like giant mosquitoes, but they don't bite, thank goodness. So. All right, that's really cool. All right, your next one comes to us from Knoxville, Tennessee. Found this one hovering last evening. Some say June bug, but Google says May bug. Yeah, so <laughs> entomologists are not very original when they give out common names. Um, so May bug and June bug, they're interchangeable to the same genus of scarab beetles, which is Philophaga. This could also possibly be a chafer. Um, but regardless, these are the type of beetles where the white grubs will feed on the roots of turf grass and cause damage in lawns. So May beetle, June beetle, where, when, whatever month you found it in, you can call it. All right. Your next one uh, comes to us from Lincoln. What's this? So this is a really cool, I'm not sure if I've, I've ever seen this one in the area personally. This is um, a longhorn flower beetle. So mostly with longhorn beetles, we associate them with like boring into trees, but these guys like um, pollen and nectar and you can find them on flowers and they're good pollinators. Excellent, and one more, this is a Bellevue viewer. This one was staring at her through the window. <laughs> yep, so this is um, one of the robber flies again and you can tell because they have a nice little beard. I like, you got the face shot so we can see the beard. But these guys are just generalist predators so they'll eat things like bees, wasps, stink bugs and grasshoppers. All right, excellent, thanks Kate. Okay, Dennis, your first two pictures come to us from Jefferson, South Dakota. Okay. Uh, he has a fenced garden and he's busy soaking his tomatoes and his peppers, but something has been rooting around since he started flood watering, not harming the plants, but moving around. So what, what, what do we Voles think? with a V. Voles with a V. Microtis, yep. All right, so no big deal. Well, they will eat some of the plants. Yeah. Um, you can use a catch-all or multi-trap. All right, excellent. You have two more, and this is an Omaha viewer, and oh. he says, what animal is this eating a green peach on the ground? It was gray, about the size of a cat, mm -hmm. picked up a peach and ate it with his front paws. Yep, that's a woodchuck or groundhog call me, the same uh, Mona Monax. Okay, so it's now- It's a younger one, it's a cool one. So now we're gonna get the request for the woodchuck recipes like we had a few years ago. Oh yeah, well, yeah. no groundhog. <laughs> okay, two more, and this is a Beatrice viewer, uh, planted dill, and they've now found it cut off at the base, like someone came with clippers. Yeah, the way it's cut off, it doesn't look like it's cut in from the side. If it is, it was small things, so I'm saying it's Kate's. Um, it's an insect more than, because any rodent that would do it, it wouldn't look like that. Okay, all right, some some creature, Kate. So. I might disagree with that one, oh, you but <laughs> yeah, but we'll talk about it later. Okay. We need a trail cam. <laughs> all right, Mike, uh, this is a buffalo grass lawn that's 10 years old, perfect for about 10 feet or 20 feet. The next stretch looks like the second picture here isn't irrigated, there don't seem to be bugs. He did use a weed killer in the spring. Is this a disease of buffalo grass or just environmental? Yeah, I think this is another tricky one. Um, if it, the sward or the, the grass looked good and then the application happened, I, it could be a misapplication in a part of the lawn. Um, so without seeing a little more of this and being on spot, I, I'm a little puzzled. Yeah, and no real disease. No, I don't, I don't think so. All righty, and then we have one here from Millard 
yellow spots showing up in the turf. The whole blade is yellow with no insect damage. Yeah, I think this is definitely environmental with the changes in the weather, the mm -hmm. moving from cooler temperatures to the high heat, 100 degree temperature, the moisture, the drought. Um, this is not atypical in mixed stands like this. All right, and one more. This is a Benkelman viewer, and they say this spot started to die off last spring. She planted seed last fall. In the spring, nothing came up. It's as if the ground is dying and leaving these white particles behind. Yeah, I spent a little bit of time looking at Dundee County's soil maps uh, and <laughs> didn't find any evidence that they were calcareous. So um, this is a tricky one too. Um, would like to see more and I would definitely get a soil sample on this. Right, hard to know. There hard might be something buried what lies beneath, yep. right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Sarah, um, two pictures here. This is an Air Nebraska viewer. Uh, they want to know if this plant is dangerous to horses and people. They found it in their hay ground. Uh, how does she get rid of it? It has been cut and baled. So it is hemp dog bane, which is poisonous to cattle and horses. Um, I'm not a livestock person, but what, from what I could find, uh, cattle generally avoid it when it's green growing in a pasture, but they will eat it dried in hay. Um, so it is definitely something you need to control. It, um, uh, one mechanical method would be mowing, regular mowing uh, to knock the foliage down. There are some herbicides that um, are, can be used, but they're not going to be extremely effective. The recommendations I saw said, you know, expect 60 to 80 percent control. Um, so in the spring uh, on the new plants, a 2,4-D dicamba type application, or in the fall uh, with a glyphosate, uh, since this is a perennial and it has a very fleshy rhizomatous root system that you need to kill. But this is something you're going to have to stay after. It's not going to be quick control. All right, and get it out of that hay before you feed the horses. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, two pictures on this one. Sarah, this is a McCook viewer. She found the plant at Hugh Butler Lake north of McCook. Mm -hmm. What do we think on this one? So that first picture looks like the common uh, wild four o'clock, which is a native wildflower that we have you know, in this area. Um, it's actually past the blooming stage. The flowers are kind of a magenta pink, purplish color. But what this, the flowers have actually fallen off and what is left behind are these bracts. This one though, I think is a different species of wild floricalc. I think it's, it's um, a Mirabilis albidinus, which is a little bit less common, um, but two, two wildflowers. All right, and two pictures on this uh, next one, Sarah. This is a Hickman viewer. Is this a good plant and what is it? Or is it a bad plant and he needs to dig it up? This is another wildflower. Um, uh, it's a primrose, uh, an anathora species, probably the most common one. Um, so it's a, it's a wildflower. It's not particularly showy. They usually have just a few flowers blooming on that stalk at a time. So, you know, you can keep it if you like the wildflowers, but if it's not showy enough, you can get rid of it too. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, good gardeners know the benefits of mulching around their trees, shrubs, ornamentals, and their vegetable gardens. Here's Jeff to tell us what those benefits are and what kind of material makes the best mulch. A frequent question we get on Backyard Farmer is mulching. What kind of mulch should I use? Where should I use it? How much should I use? And you know, it, sometimes it kind of depends on the situation. For most of our plants on campus or at your home, we're gonna to wanna to use an organic mulch. In particular, we use a, a mixed hardwood mulch that we generate here on campus. The same sort of thing you can buy at your local nursery. Um, and so we're gonna to wanna to use two to three inches of an organic mulch around plants like this, around your trees and shrubs. We try to mulch as large an area as possible. That seems reasonable. Um, and the mulch, as, it, as you put down the mulch, it does a few things. It helps retain moisture in the soil. So the soil moisture, there's less fluctuation. It's more evenly moist. Um, it helps break, it'll break down over time and help add some micronutrients to the soil and just improve the, the uh, biology, the microbiome of that area. So microorganisms and all the good things that happen uh, as mulch breaks down and helps the plants and the root zones. But you can think about a few other things. You know, there's other organic mulches you can use. Uh, there's corn cob mulch out there. There's other plant kind of waste mulches that are out there. I've seen cotton seed holes. There's cocoa bean mulch. So there's a lot of different things you could use that again are organic mulch that'll provide that same sort of thing. And you might like the textures a little differently. 
depending on the plant you're using or the location you're using around your home. But again, two to three inches is probably something you're gonna wanna reapply annually. Um, keep an eye on it. You're not gonna want it to get too thick. We don't want it too thick because it also create kind of a dry zone as well. Um, so that's the other thing that you wanna watch is make sure that the moisture is getting through the mulch to the plants. Now there's some other mulches, we'll use that word, uh, uh, to describe things like river rock uh, or different kinds of rock mulches that are out there. There's a rubber pelletized mulches you may have seen. So there's some other mulches that you can use. And typically I would suggest you use those in areas where really plants are not the emphasis of that particular part of your landscape. Um, many times you're gonna wanna make sure you put down some sort of fabric, some sort of landscape fabric as a barrier to keep that mulch from uh, mixing in with the soil. Um, and you'll use those in areas, maybe if you have a, a area in your basement that's getting wet, you wanna protect that and stop the water from penetrating through there. You'll put down the fabric, put down the inorganic mulch, the rock or rubber or whatever it is to help protect those areas. Um, but again, you might wanna use the inorganic mulches in places where we don't have plants and we wanna use an organic mulch where we have plants. Rock mulch is fine around the foundation to keep those critters away. Most of the time, the organic mulch really is the best choice around your plants. You know, you can see this in all of our other features we've recently had about Western Nebraska gardening issues on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. All of those recent past programs and features are posted there. If you have any special problems around your home landscape or garden, chances are we've had a feature that will give you the answers you're looking for. So do check out the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel after the show. Always we have announcements of great stuff going on in the gardening world. Our first one is the Plymouth Flower and Art Show, Saturday, July 9th, 10 to 2, at the Plymouth Community Building. Our second one is the Daylily Drive Open House, Saturday, July 9th, and Sunday, July 10th, uh, and that's also in Plymouth. And our third one is East Campus Discovery Days, Saturday, July 9th, 10 to 2, East Campus Mall. The weather is going to be perfect. And so is the ice cream. <laughs> All right, uh, Kate, you have uh, three questions this round. The first one is uh, one picture, and it is, what is this little guy found on her truck in Papillion? So this is an, a very original name again, an orange wing geometer moth. <laughs> it has orange wings. <laughs> okay, and is, is its larva a good guy? or? A... Um, they're not pests. They feed on um, honeysuckle, I believe. Oh, excellent, all right. Your second one is um, south of Raymond. He found this, what's this? So this is one of the metallic wood boring beetles. So it's in the same family of emerald ash borer. Um, but these guys in particular, if it's the one I'm thinking of, which would be the sculptured pine borer, they generally just attack trees that are already dead or dying and stressed out. So they're not um, that big of a pest. All right. Uh, and your next one is, um, this viewer sent it to us from Springfield. She said she found these in the, the, the uh, garden decoration frog, Dennis, coming out of his mouth, <laughs> ranging from larva to about an inch in size. Are they friendly or should they run for cover? They should run for cover. These are <laughs> paper wasps. So they're one of the social wasps, which means they will get aggressive to protect their nest. Um, so the best thing you can do is just get one of those cans of wasp spray, go out at um, night when they're less active with protective clothing on, um, and then once you're sure that they're all dead, you can remove the nest if you're able to from the frog's mouth. Okay. <laughs> uh, frog, a live frog would have yeah. been better. Yeah. Okay, all right, uh, Dennis, it's scat night. Oh, I knew I couldn't, I couldn't make it through. <laughs> so uh, the first one here is a Gretna viewer. She found this in the barn and wondered what- It's bat. Yeah. Pointing one end, curled, blunt on the other end, bat. Right, bat. All right, uh, second one here comes to us from Stanton. They found this near the garden, mm. any idea? Well, it's omnivore, no hair. It's gonna be, it's a true omnivore and it's big and round. It's either gonna be a pig or a wild pig or Uncle Eddie. <laughs> You How do we ever get a... All right, we cannot continue. <laughs> Keep going. I want the next one. All right, your next two. You have two pictures of this next one. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, where is he? He doesn't say some 
if an animal has been leaving this in areas that are rock or right. mulch, yeah. no large dogs loose. Right, so it's a younger raccoon. The way it's curled, it's got some seed in it, very little hair, that's younger raccoon. And he's, he is wondering how to keep this guy from doing this. <laughs> how to make the raccoon constipate it? <laughs> I think you'd just rather uh, cage trap the raccoon and remove the raccoon. Okay, and you can't relocate. Right. Yeah. We could 100 feet and then he won't come back. <laughs> okay. Okay, Mike, I don't know how you're going to follow that. I'm not going to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Your first one comes to us from Orleans, Nebraska. It just simply wants to know what kind of shroom this is. Yeah, I think this is a dryad saddle. It's uh, growing on the dead tree there at the, the base. Uh, just um, He didn't ask if it's edible and uh, don't eat mushrooms unless you have an expert that can tell you unequivocally that they're safe and I'm not that person. So <laughs> dryad salad, saddle, I think is the name of this All fungus. Right. All right, the next one, uh, not a great picture, but she says, what is this? She's eating about six of them. They're in Northwest Omaha, heavily shaded. Yeah, this is a stink, uh, stinkhorn fungus. Uh, if you mushroom, if you take a look at it, the cap, when they get mature, the cap gets black. Uh, gooey, sticky spores. It actually attracts flies. It also smells pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> smells like the pictures that yeah. Dennis <laughs> just identified, actually. Yeah. And the flies actually carry the spores and, and move them around. Um, all the stinkhorn fun fungi are actually edible. If you catch them before they get stinky, <laughs> don't wait until this stage. You'll, you'll, you won't like that. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, and you have one more here, and this is a Lincoln viewer. Tar-like patches, uh, they've found it, and of course people always think this is dog poop or vomit. Yeah, this is actually a slime mold. Um, they come in all different colors, um, pretty harmless, will go away on its own, and uh, that's what it is, slime mold. It's been a good year for slime mold. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> all right, <laughs> Sarah, uh, your first one here is uh, a viewer from West Omaha. What is causing the black spots on, the, on these maters? So this is something we see every year. This is blossom end rot which is actually caused by a lack of calcium in those cells when that little tomato was develop, developing. We also see this in peppers, we see it in eggplant, in watermelon, so it, we see it in, in more than just tomatoes. So typically uh, what we do is we focus on water management because calcium is not very mobile in the plants. The plants need to have a lot of water to be able to move that calcium, that calcium well. So make sure you have, um, maintain your moisture in the soil, make sure the plants are mulched, um, sometimes we see the first tomatoes of the year have blossom end rot because the plant wasn't um, as efficient with its root system as it was getting established. So you can take those off and later tomatoes may be fine. Um, but the, the, the products you spray on plants, the blossom end rot stoppers are generally not effective. Plants don't take calcium in well through the foliage. So it really goes back to water management. All right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, two pictures on this next one quickly. This is a Kearney, Nebraska viewer. Yeah, the little yellow spots are stink bug damage. The, the big physical, or the big crack there in the middle looks to me like physical damage. So I'm gonna guess maybe hail or something like that that um, impacted this tomato earlier in the season. So they can eat it as long as they... Yeah, you can cut that spot out and eat the rest of it. All right, and you have one more here, and this is a Randolph, uh, Nebraska viewer. They, they wonder what disease the bell peppers have. Um, so they bought this this spring. Actually, this is herbicide damage. Um, you can see that earlier in the season, this, tomato, this pepper had pretty normal looking leaves, um, but it, it pretty looks like a pretty significant exposure to some type of herbicide. I don't know if at this point in the season this plant is gonna recover, so I would probably just yank it out and get it out of the garden. All right, unfortunately for that. Mm -hmm. okay.